The PEC, or the posterior exterior chain, is a term developed by Postural Restoration Institute, or PRI for short, that describes this additional layer of compensation that is built upon an already existing left AIC or right BC pattern. If you have not seen my articles and videos on those two things already, I highly recommend you check them out before going into this video because we're going to build upon those concepts. Muscles that are incorporated within this posterior exterior chain are going to be the lats, which are these big muscles that run into the thoracolumbar fascia, which run into our pelvis. We also have the quadratus lumborum, this posterior core muscle. And we also have the spinal erectors, or paraspinals, which are going to run up and down throughout our entire spine here. We also have things like the serratus posterior and the posterior intercostals, which are going to be involved within that chain as well. Now, when these muscles get tight, it's going to hold us or push us into this extended pattern, because all these muscles, if they just contract and they stay tight, they compress us, and they're going to push us forward into this extended position, and they can hold us there through extension tone that they're creating. So basically what I'm saying is that these muscles are going to be partially responsible for holding us in this extended position. And look at what that did to the front side of the body there. We're going to flare these ribs right here. So we're going to be in a position of anterior pelvic tilt or anterior orientation. And the ribs here are going to be externally rotated, especially right here because this flare pushes them up. Now within the pelvis itself, what you're oftentimes going to see is some degree of these bones flaring outward into external rotation. So these people are going to be externally rotated within the rib cage, their pelvis pushed here, and now everything is forward as well. But here's the thing is I've talked about the left AIC pattern, but underneath every PEC is this left AIC unless your organs are flip-flop from birth, and then that's a little bit of a different story, but the overwhelming majority of humans are in this left AIC pattern. And that means that you are now forward on both sides, and you are just a little bit more forward on your left side now, but both sides as a whole are forward and oriented into this relatively more externally rotated position, like so. And these ribs here, are going to be more flared, but on the left side, usually it's just a little bit more. So how do we fall into this PEC pattern? How does this occur? Well, it's very much individual in terms of the timing and how that's actually going to be influenced by our lifestyle, our training history in the gym or previous sports. Maybe we had an injury and we need to self-organize around it in order to keep ourselves moving forward because humans are ultimately very much concerned with moving forward in space. So if we can't do it naturally, quote unquote, through relative motions of our pelvis like this, we will just push the whole pelvis forward and orient ourselves in space. And now we're moving like that refrigerator analogy I would refer to in the past and how we're not getting this dissociation we're not going to have as much arm swing when we walk and we're just going to orient our body from side to side when we walk. And I think we've all seen people who move like this. So what we're going to see with this anterior pelvic tilt or orientation of the pelvis forward as a whole is that both sides are now relatively more externally rotated than they were before. The ribs are also externally rotated down below. Now you're going to have the situation where neither side can create genuine internal rotation. That's because in order to do that, let's say we were doing that Ober's test or adduction drop test, what you need to be able to do is bring this leg back into full hip extension, which is going to be limited if you're very forward, which is a position of hip flexion. So they're probably not even gonna be able to get all the way back. But if they do, what you're not gonna be able to do is then internally rotate, drop this femur. In order to accommodate for that, this bone actually needs to internally rotate like so to allow for that bone to drop, meaning that femur right there. So on either side, this is going to be way more limited and they're not going to pass on either side now. What you're also going to see is this person unable to squat past around 90 degrees, meaning that their thighs are parallel to the ground. This is because in order to get past that, you need to be able to get your pelvis to move back. Let's say I'm squatting down. Once I get to about here, I need to then start to tip my pelvis back and then access external rotation the deeper I go from there. 
So these people, because they're forward on both sides to start, their pelvis only has one direction to go when they go down, which is back. So it's going to be more hingy in nature. They're probably going to get to a round parallel and they're going to get stuck. And the only way they can get lower is if they just butt wink underneath themselves and just roll their whole pelvis down. Within the rib cage itself, because this is forward and these ribs are now flared up, you're going to see a lot of tightness on the back side of this whole thorax right here. So the scapula is going to be jammed against the rib cage. It's not going to be able to glide very well. So this person will be quite limited in their ability to access shoulder flexion. So if you were to lay them down and have them bring their arm overhead and measure it very genuinely and watch for compensations, that shoulder blade is not going to be able to glide on the rib cage to accommodate for that. So they're probably going to get stuck around 90 degrees, meaning right about here before you start to see the el elbow flare out or any sort of back arching that would be excessive beyond the point of what we're looking for. Now there actually is an additional layer of compensation that can occur after a PEC pattern and that would be a patho PEC in PRI and what this basically means is that we have so much extension tone. Everything is really tight on this back side. Things are starting to get pretty tight on this front side too. So this person is being squished like a pancake from all directions. Now, in order for us to still be mobile and find range of motion, there is a world in which people can create laxity within their system. And there's a couple of different reasons and potentially causes of this, but it depends on the individual. And I've seen a lot of different arguments for how this laxity forms. And to be completely honest with you, I'm not entirely sure myself whether it's the ligaments, the joints as a whole, whether it is the muscles around these structures. There's a lot of different things, but what the general idea is, is that we are going to create laxity within our pelvis, within our rib cage potentially as well. Now there are a couple of different ways this laxity can take form, but specifically within the muscles themselves, you're going to see strategies of elongation. So an example of that would be if I've got all this extension tone here, these muscles, this posterior exterior chain is holding me in extension right here, then muscles on the back side of the pelvis, like the hamstrings right here, which run down and attach up here on the ischial tuberosity, then they're going to become elongated. And if they're chronically elongated for a period of months or years or whatever it is relative to that individual, they're going to become very much stretched out. So there are worlds in which these people can present with ranges of motion that we would not expect this person to be able to access given how much compression and tightness is within their system. So we might measure these people or assess them and say, hang on, that doesn't make a lot of sense based off of what I've seen within these other assessments. So something isn't lining up here. Something is giving way for this person to be able to do the following things. The other standout test would be a toe touch. And in order to go into a full toe touch properly and access these genuine relative motions within the pelvis, we need to move from internal rotation to external rotation but we also need to eccentrically orient or elongate the muscles of the low back and just back as a whole. If this person is forward and has a lot of that extension tone, they're not gonna be able to do that very effectively, yet they're still palming the floor. So that could also play into this laxity strategy, potentially of the hamstrings or just orienting their whole pelvis forward and down and potentially back in order to accomplish that. And they're not going to actually be getting these relative motions here. Now let's talk about what we can actually do about it. If I've got a standard PEC who's not patho, then let's think about where they are. They're very extended. They have a lot of tone in the back. We might be thinking, what do we need to do to turn things on to get them in a better position? But really the name of the game is going to be, what do we need to inhibit in order to get our pelvis into a more quote unquote neutral state to allow for this to occur so that we can then access these genuine ranges of motion. We need to downregulate the tone of this PEC chain right here. And we can do that via positions that are going to allow us to breathe into our back, expand this posterior mediastinum, which is this big cavity in our back thorax, which needs to expand upon inhalation. But right now, when they inhale, all that's happening is air is just going forward, primarily into their belly and low ribs right here. 
So the key for these people is going to be a gentle but full exhale. That is so important and I just hammer this over and over and over again with people that come into this gym because a lot of them are thinking, what muscles do I need to turn on? How do I need to orient my body? But no, it's just we need to breathe first in order to expand this back, in order to help reduce the extension tone pushing our pelvis forward and also we need to go more parasympathetic this extension tone if you puff out your chest you automatically feel more alert this is fight or flight but what we want to do is bring them back and get them more parasympathetic which is rest and digest which is recovery which is relaxation and if we can do that that's also going to give the brain a sense of safety and also awareness of these positions and references that we're going to be driving because we do want to turn things on and put the pelvis in a better position via muscles and just overall positioning. But we're going to struggle to do that if we're sympathetically driven and chronically just in this extension tone. So here's an exercise you can do that is really helpful for that. This is the wall supported reach with ball hold activity from Postural Restoration Institute. The purpose of this is to use a wall as a reference for the low back to get a little bit of flexion back in the system and drive some air into the back. So to set up for this, we need a ball that is going to be a good size, meaning that it's going to keep our knees in line with our toes and our knees in line with our hips as well. It should not be pushing our knees excessively out or in. We're gonna start up against the wall here and we're gonna do one foot length relative to the length of your individual foot away from the wall. Right about there would be good for Trevor. And then hip width apart, toes straight ahead. Now, this is not a wall sit. This is a wall supported activity. So we want to keep our whole foot flat, keeping the weight mostly in the heels, but not losing the big toe or little toe where the ball of the foot is on either foot here. But I would say about at least 60% of the weight is in the heels here on both sides. So right here, we're nice and tall, just a little bit of knee bend, nothing significant but enough to where we do have a little bit of that bend there. And we're going to push our low back into the wall. And if you wanna put your hands on your hips, you can use that as a reference to tuck your hips off of the wall. So your tailbone should be off of the wall, your upper back should be off of the wall, but the low back is in contact with the wall. And that's the only thing that's in contact with the wall. Again, maintaining that weight in the heels. And then what we'll do, Trevor, I'll have you reach down with your palms up. We're looking for about a 45 to 60-ish degree angle relative to his trunk right here. And then I'm gonna have him reach a little bit further, more and more and more, getting a little bit of rounding in that upper back. Don't be afraid to get some rounding there. It's totally okay. And we might change it depending on you as a client, but ultimately we are looking for some flexion or rounding in this upper back. So the only thing he feels in contact with the wall now is that low back and the pelvis is off of the wall tucked. Now keeping the palms up, Trevor, I want you to just keep the weight in the heels and open your mouth and just sigh the air out as gently but fully as you can. So it's not, it's sighing the air out and he should keep his stomach relaxed. And the only reason he feels any tension in his stomach whatsoever is because that full exhale is giving him the recruitment of the obliques or side abs. Not the six pack, but the side abs. Then upon that full exhale, about five to 10 seconds, he's gonna close his mouth and then breathe in through his nose, keeping that slight tension within his obliques. And that should give him a stretch and some expansion in this back right there. The other thing we want to do is we want to drive extension of the hip. We want to be able to bring this pelvis back by inhibiting what's going on here, yes, but we also want to recruit muscles like the hamstrings and also the obliques and transverse abdominis, those deep abs to help pull this back together, which the obliques and deep abs are really helpful for. And also these hamstrings down here are going to help create that posterior rotation of the pelvis. So we can do that in a couple of different ways. And here's one way you can do that. Mm -hmm. 
this is the supine hemi extension with alternating respiratory rectus femoris from Postural Restoration Institute. The purpose of this is to drive some in-range hip extension while moving the top leg in and out of knee extension for a little quad action. So to set up for this, we want to be on the edge of a table or some sort of elevated surface where we can keep our knees hanging off and our feet dangling down to the point where they are not going to be in contact with the floor. We also have a towel underneath the leg right here. And the thickness of this towel is going to be variable depending on how much you need to press down on some object to keep this leg in contact with that towel pushing down to recruit your hamstring. So we've got Trevor laying in the right proper starting position. Now Trevor, I want you to take your hands, link them on your low ribs, and that'll make sure he's not extending because if his ribs flare up, he's gonna be extending there. So make sure your low back stays nice and flat, just passively relaxed. Push down with the back of the thigh on this gently about a four to five out of 10 intensity and pull the free leg to 90 degrees of hip flexion right there. Good. He should feel some hamstring on this downside leg. Now, Trevor, I want you to inhale and extend your knee. Good. Exhale, come back. Some people are not gonna be able to fully extend their knee. It's not the end of the world. If that is you, you can go into a little bit less hip flexion, but make sure you stay around this 90 degree bend right here. Inhale up, exhale down. A little bit of quad on this leg, some hamstring on this downside leg right here. Now let's talk about the patho PEC, and this is a good time for me to talk about how these additional layers of compensation build and build, and sometimes when we're really, really far forward, we're going to see instances and cases where people start to get squished from front to back. They start to get this compression on the front side as well as the back side. And what tends to happen is these rectus abdominis, which attach up here and down the lowest most portion of our anterior pelvis here, they can start to pull us down because the body senses it's falling too far forward. It needs to pull itself back. So you might see people with these sway back postures but that doesn't mean they don't have extension tone. They're just being squished from all directions and they still have that underlying extension tone, but now their body just orients in a way that allows them to feel stable. So just keep that in mind. And I do have a video and article on sway back posture if you're curious to check that out. But what we need to do with these patho PECs first is give them the ability to, yes, bring their pelvis into a neutral position, but we also want to give them lots of references so that they can create the ability to find genuine internal rotation. To keep this video relatively digestible and not very, very long, I'm going to be choosing one exercise in this video per goal. But if you want more exercises and more information, check out the article I'm writing alongside this. I'm gonna link it down below in the description. It'll have a lot of really good information laid out for you there as well. This is the 90-90 hip lift and passive internal rotation from Postural Restoration Institute. The purpose of this is to get us in a position where we can reposition the pelvis, restore a little bit more of a neutral pelvic orientation while driving a little bit of internal rotation through the femurs in this 90-90 position. So to set up for this, we need a ball which is going to allow us to keep our knee in line with our hip but we also want to start with these feet slightly outside of our knees. This is that passive internal rotation aspect of this activity here. Now, the degree of which you are in this passive internal rotation should not be overly significant, so we're not way out here. We should just be maybe 10 to 15 degrees of internal rotation, so about here is what we're gonna be looking for. Now, what we're gonna do here is place our hands on our low ribs, maintaining contact of the foot, and this is really important, of the heel and also this base of the big toe where the ball of the foot is here and not losing this lateral toe right here, but focusing on this part right here and the inner heel. And we're going to keep our foot on the wall and on both sides, we're gonna think about dragging down on the wall 
with that inner aspect of the foot where the foot arch would be, and that'll naturally tuck our hips off of the ground slightly. So the tailbone comes slightly off of the floor, and we should feel our inner hamstring muscles as we do that. And now what we're going to do is just maintain this position. Exhale through our mouth, big open mouth sigh. For about five to 10 seconds, keeping our stomach relaxed. And the only reason why we feel any tension whatsoever is because we are getting recruitment of our side abs through that long extended and soft exhale. That's why it's five to 10 seconds long. And then we're gonna maintain a slight amount of tension in those side abs as we inhale through our nose, keeping our mouth closed. Closed, and that's going to expand our chest and our back. And that's exactly what we're looking for there, all the while maintaining those foot pressures and feeling those inner hamstrings on both sides. If you're having a hard time feeling your hamstrings, you can set up a shelf for yourself like this, but it's really important to make sure that you are A, still in a 90-90 position, and B, keeping your whole foot on the wall, because we're trying to still feel those foot pressures on the wall. If your feet are off of a wall and you're just digging into a chair or a sofa or something like that, then you're not going to be able to create that reference of the arch of the foot, working with the inner hamstrings, working with the pelvic position that we're looking for. So it's very important that we are maintaining foot pressure on a wall here. So through this process, what we should be able to accomplish is bringing this pelvis back and bringing these ribs down and expanding the back. But because everyone has this underlying left AIC pattern, or at least the overwhelming majority of humans, we are going to have an easier time bringing the right side back than the left, because the left side started out more forward than the right. And this PEC pattern brings both sides forward, but the right side is still less forward than the left. So what you're probably going to see is that the internal rotation-based measurements on the right side come back quicker than the left that's totally okay and expected because once you achieve the ability to get that right adduction and internal rotation and the measurements you would probably expect to see more in terms of the left AIC and right BC pattern, then you can just go and start using those exercises. Hopefully this provides you some really good ideas and information on the PEC pattern. In my experience, most people actually are PECs. A lot of people are not just a left AIC pattern because the human body likes to move into extension when it can't actually access these ranges of motion genuinely through relative motion. That's the segments moving within one another. So it's nothing to be afraid of and it doesn't need to be fixed in everyone all the time immediately, but it can be associated with certain types of pain and movement limitations. And if your goal is to improve those things, then this video should give you a lot of really good tools to help with that.